Welcome one and a welcome to you all to the greatest show of them all. It is the NFC East mixtape volume. Not one, not two, not three, not four, not five. Okay, LeBron. Not, uh, volume 157. You can listen to us on any one of SB Nation's NFC East blog podcast networks. You can also watch us on the Bleeding Green Nation YouTube channel or the Blogging the Boys YouTube channel. If you do any of those things, you will experience in whatever fashion you decide to do so. The stylings of myself, Amar Joe Cho from Blogging the Boys, and the stylings of himself he has randomly gotten from Bleeding Green Nation. Speaking of styles, he is uh, dressed for the week. Opening day is upon us. How about those fills that lost the World Series a couple years back? Uh, I'm going to the home opener. Shout out to my good friend Matt for hooking me up with the tickets. I don't Matthew! know. Matthew! And former BGN radio host. Uh, I don't know if it's going to make it because there's rain in the forecast, but mm. hopefully it works out. I'm excited to go at some point. Should be fun. Glad baseball is back. Phillies open the season at home. Against when? the Braves. Oh, and L.E. Thursday. Okay, so well, opening day is a home game for the Phillies. I didn't know if it, I, off the top of my head if Philly was at yeah. home or on the road to start the season. Okay. Wow. Um, I feel like the Braves are probably to the, like the, if the Phillies are your Eagles, I think the Braves are maybe your Cowboys. Like who's who's your baseball version of the Cowboys? Um, I guess. I mean, for some people, that's the Mets. Mm. Uh, I don't like the Mets, but I also think they're kind of just so they're almost like they get in their way so much. Well, maybe they're like the, the Cowboys commander. corollary. Yeah. yeah, they get in their way so much. It's kind of like they're not threatening, actually. Um, obviously the Braves have been like incredibly good in the regular season and then we just beat them in the playoffs. Um, so I don't know, but, uh, I definitely hate if we're talking about all sports, other teams, I hate the most Cowboys number one, probably. And then Celtics are probably right behind them at number two. Interesting. It's, um, I don't have a, an Eagles comp for my Astros because it's definitely not the Rangers. I wouldn't do that to, um, to DFW because the Eagles are my most hated team, but, um, I don't know. Um, Maybe the Mariners a little bit, just really? a tiny bit. Yeah, there's there's a little bit of of that kind of energy. Um, in some but that's respect. such like a you know they're so not threatening. <laughs> they're like the least yeah. threatening team. Well, it's there's not. I mean, I I don't mean this this way, but there's not really a team that's been threatening to the Astros. I mean, maybe the Rangers are that now. Um, obviously they've lost two World Series, but um, I think Yankees fans would love to say that it's them, but I mean it's not. Like it's a. It has to be a back and forth thing to be threatening and to be a rivalry, and you know we've discussed that many different times. And they're just I want to hear from the listeners which team they hate the most that isn't a football team, right? So if it you're, isn't you're the Cowboys or Eagles or yeah. Commanders or Giants, uh, who do you? Well, hate no, just no, no football, no NFL teams. Just like your other sports teams, you hate the most, and why? While so we're here, us. but even though we ask them for non-football teams, what is the non-NFC East NFL team you hate the most? Uh, non, I mean it kind of. Like go comes and goes, I would say the Saints for that team Actually, for a while. I mean, can I guess yours and you guess mine? I think that'd be fun. But I mean, obviously, I think I have an obvious answer now. Okay, I what's think, yours? I think your answer now is the Niners. Yeah, um, yeah, because of everything. So yeah, that wasn't always the case, and for the while, the while I could see the Saints, Saints being that for a while. Um, maybe the Cardinals have a chance to become that, especially like mm. a little bit of a John. Well, I mean, if we're talking like you know future potential, but we'll see. Uh, it's a big going? leap. Uh, yours? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't feel like you have a team because you know you, you hate it on the Broncos. So there's teams like that you kind of rip on. I don't think you necessarily definitely like hate them as a rivalry though. You just think they're stupid, so you rip mm -hmm. on them. That's there's a difference there. That's true. Um, so I don't know what that team is. Yeah, I don't really hate the Niners, even though they've owned the Cowboys, because it's it's just like like I can't hate. If it's not a rivalry. Yeah, exactly. It's like what you know, Joel, Joel Embiid said when the, it's, the, it's the just like Sixers being, can't beat the Celtics. It's yeah. just like being beat down. So like I really can't have a hatred as much as I just have an annoyance. There's a different emotion there. But mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I had to pick one non NFC East team right now. For all, in the like early 2010s, it was the Texans because you know at the time when I was in college at A and M, everybody was. Like there were so many Houston people and they were just rubbing it in my face, like the TJ Yates thing. He has as many playoff wins as Tony Romo, and it was so annoying. Um, so but they now now I'm cool with the Texans. It might be it might be the Packers. I mm, mean that makes the most sense. Yeah, yeah. It, it might be the Packers, but even with Aaron Rodgers gone, it's I know, I know like I'm not saying that's invalid, but it's funny that a lot of that had to do with Aaron Rodgers, and he's not even there anymore. 
and it's yeah. still the case. Um, oh, well. Um, kind of a hodgepodge start to the show. It is a hodgepodge kind of show. That was the word BLG used right before we started recording. Um, the NFL's annual league meeting has been going on, one of them, uh, in Orlando for the last couple of days. And there are some headlines and takeaways. Um Owners and coaches and executives and dignitaries have spoken for every NFL team. We obviously have some thoughts on everything that people associated with the NFC East have said. But um, in an overarching perspective, we also have some rules changes. I know you'll talk about these at BGN, um, and we've t- begun talking about them at BTB, certainly by the time um, this conversation is heard. Uh, the most notable one has to do with the kickoff, and this actually was uh, partly led by John Fossil, Dallas Cowboys special teams coordinator, uh, one of the presenters. Uh, the, the proposal was passed technically on a one-year basis, but the way these things always tend to go is they say that, but it's it's really forever. Um, the, it's the XFL rule. The So the, the place kicker hasn't moved, correct? Like there, there's no movement in terms of where the place kicker lined up. It's just now you're changing where the respective kickoff teams are lining up and you're allowing time for the uh, receiver or the catcher to field the ball before any kind of movement can take place. Yeah, there's a good explanation of all this on SBNation.com. I put that on the BGN cover, too, if you just want to go there and see it. Um, but in any case, I like this because, and I, and I think most people who either don't like this or don't care didn't watch the XFL. And I think that's that's fair. That's fine. Not everyone watched, had to watch the XFL. But when I watched the XFL, uh, and it's not like I watched every single game, but I saw some. I think I saw a touchdown return on one of these, and I was like, "Oh, that's kind of fun to see again." And in general, I liked it. I don't. I don't think it's like overly gimmicky. I think it makes sense. It's legitimately a way to make it a safer play, uh, but still have entertainment value. So I actually think it's fine. And as I've said a number of times, I think to you or just in general on podcast over the years, what is the big deal with the NFL trying things for a year? Like if you can make pass interference challengeable for a year just to placate sean payton why can't you just try most things it's silly to me that they won't allow the eagles fourth and 20 onside kick alternative proposal for at least a year just give it a year and if it sucks get rid of it it's fine just try it i would offer um the fourth and what what they amended it to fourth and 19 right this year whatever it was it's fourth Um, and 20 but i mean there was like a proposal or something that was like it was not an even number um is what i'm saying but either way i'm with you like i would totally try that um and not just uh the sean payton acquiescence that we saw but and this was a good change but the niners acquiescence which is part of why you hate them the emergency third quarterback thing i don't I mean, hate that change i know you don't i'm just saying you hate them partly as a result of the game in which the change partly stemmed from so yeah like we were willing to try that that was a good thing i like that idea <coughs> excuse me i like this idea as well because I, and I didn't want to lose the kickoff. Um, just I en- yeah, maybe, I don't like, agree with just eliminate it. I don't agree with that. Yeah, like call me, you know, a fan of pageantry or whatever. But like, I like the ceremonial part of it. I like. I think the- it's good for the pacing. I think it's good to kind of like slow, just like at a show, at a concert. You go to a concert, you don't just have a band play like just all of their hits all the time. Like, you, well, you can't, or even too much. or even it's not just like continuous music. There's a break after a song, and you know whatever this and that. So that's a good a concert's a good comp. So I agree. I don't know why they won't try the Eagles thing. I don't know why they won't try a lot of things, but um, this is good. This is a good change. I'm excited to see what Mm -hmm. it ultimately yields. I'm excited uh, individually from a Cowboys slant about how John Fossil approaches this. I don't know how much Eagles fans know about John Fossil, although he did interview for that head coaching job when it went to Nick Sirianni, um, along with now Eagles offensive coordinator Kellen Moore. That's got to be really awkward for Kellen, by the way. I mean, I keep thinking about that, but whatever. Anyway, um, former... Cowboys quarterback Will Greer now in Philly. That's right. Uh, we're not talking about the Eagles here. This is you know the Cowboys. Well, I mean, it's, 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 he's a former Cowboys quarterback. Good, good. Ooh, sneaky. That was a, a nice little loophole. But um, John Fossil is elite at at exploiting advantages like this. Like if there is something Howie Roseman like within the Cowboys, mm-hmm. it is John Fossil. Um, he will find the the teeny tiny nooks and crevices or whatever that he can sort of work with. And so I'm excited to see how he does this. Uh, how he approaches this. They have Kevante Turpin. I was going to say, it's big for him. Yeah, I mean, it is a a really interesting dynamic that we're going to see. The other notable changes that we saw, speaking of the emergency third quarterback, now a practice squad quarterback can be elevated an unlimited amount of times to the active game day roster for the purposes of serving as an emergency third quarterback. It'll be interesting to see who teams put there because it'll clearly be we think you're valuable enough to where you could be our starting quarterback in an emergency of upon emergencies, but 
we don't think you're valuable enough to protect you and put you on our active roster all the time. Um, well, it does okay. count though as one of your two elevations that you get per week. Still, so, it does. I'm, I'm so, saying you no. Know, there are situations where you might want to have those two for in case of injuries at other positions. So it's not like it's not an automatic that you just definitely put that third quarterback sure. on the practice squad. There's a lot of gymnastics that'll be associated with it. Also, on the subject of two, you can now place two players on injured reserve in initial roster cutdowns from 90 to 53, and return. Ret- excuse me, you can return two people from injured reserve in that process. So if you have two players who get hurt at training camp or preseason or whatever, you can put two players on IR as you trim down to 53 and return two at maximum that used to just be unlike one. yeah before where you had to have them on the original 50 right. man roster until waivers clear the original round of waivers clear and then you can put them on IR. So basically that was like the anti phantom AR IR thing, you know, like the stash IR. Now that is the that yeah you can you, stash people in that you had to, well, you can stash too because you had to right. carry whoever you wanted to stash initially right um so, remember when you only used to be able to return one person from ir period like that yeah, was that's so, insane that's so what, stupid yeah. like looking back on that um what, what good reason is there for that it, it was really 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 dumb so we've come a long way i think those were the notable changes if i'm unless i'm overlooking something is there anything well, else? Well, the hip job tackle is obviously oh, yeah. the the bad. I just to me, it's not a real thing. Like people, it's just so subjective, and I think it's it's so dumb. And I don't. That's not an original take. I think everyone's on the same page for the most part with that. Um, the players don't want it in there, so it's not just about as simple as like player safety. It's I, it's so subjective. It's not like a real thing. When was anyone using that term like five years ago? Even a couple seasons ago, ten like. This isn't like a long term thing. It's just like something that people started to coin as a phrase because there were some high profile injuries. I think and w- one of the biggest involved the Cowboys. It was Tony Pollard in the divisional loss two years ago now. It's not um, a real thing. Well, I mean, I think people's worry goes back to the Sean Payton pass interference thing is people are worried about officials ability to call this. I, I don't so think subjective. I know. I don't think anybody disagrees. Like, like nobody has the take. I am fine with a dangerous tackle that hurts players. No, Nobody thinks that. I think what everyone thinks is, okay, great. If we can get rid of dangerous tackles that are intentional and purposeful and therefore hurtful, we should. And if we can police that, then we can. But if we're just going to be policing all these things and we have no idea what's actually happening and it's all vague and it's all ambiguous and it's all subjective, it's just going to lead to horribly time penalties that are going to swing games and swing contests one way or another. It's just like, what's the teaching point here if you're going away from that? And also, what's a smaller person supposed to do, like a smaller defender supposed to do against like a big tight end or something? Like, they that's like physics, right? It's like you need the leverage to get that guy down. I, I, I it just seems very dumb to me. Also, um, if we're just going off of literal things that happen, the NFL moved the trade deadline back a week. So it is the that's Tuesday. so lame to me. It's just like, well, I mean, I'm just telling you what happened. No, I yeah, I understand, but it's just like that's just such a half measure. It's like very cowboys of the NFL to just be like if you're it's like oh, we're just going to restructure 4 million of Dak Prescott's contract. It's just like either do it or don't. What is this half measure thing? Like if you're going to move it back, move it back a little bit more so then it's actually significant. Like what is one week really accomplish? I don't think it changes too much. I'm happy they did it. I think it should be later. There should be more of a clear buy or sell line for teams. I think that would be fun in both directions and ultimately good for teams because I think right now, I think you would agree with this teams tend to just stay pat. They just feel because they're because teams are so delusional. They'll be like, we can still make a run. We're going to hold on to everyone. Um, And it's dumb. And that results in a team, I guess, I don't know if this is the only reason for it, but like, you know, the Panthers holding on to Brian Burns when they could have gotten like this huge offer for him. Instead, they eventually just uh, only get, you know, a second round pick and whatever for him. So yeah, I think it'd be a better good to have a better, defining line on that uh two things on this one to your point really but uh well, i guess the only one to your point the nfl added a, a week to the regular season three years ago so this is really just kind of catching up you know what i'm saying like this is like where it was roundabout you know what i mean relative to the you know a 16 game regular season this so, is like the adjust for inflation right yeah so it really measure. isn't anything new i would like to see some research in um so i'm going to make up numbers but something like oh research shows that um week i don't know 14 is when on like relatively speaking in history is when the first team is mathematically eliminated from playoff contention so like if you found that to be true over the course you know of the last i don't know 50 years whatever and then you were to say okay because of this research week 14 
is our new trade deadline or week 13 because you have to decide like man we we have like a five percent you know chance to make the playoffs or whatever blah blah so we really have to decide like it should be based off of some history not just like what feels right you know what i mean well there's that and there's also the context that people have done with like the different sports leagues and where it, it where the deadline falls relative to like the percentage completed of their seasons and obviously the nfl is like way ahead of those and that also kind of lends to the idea that okay maybe you should push it back a bit so yeah i mean i guess i think part of the problem i'm guessing is they don't want it like on thanksgiving because that's you know it's not like well, it's not ideal i think for them um but... speaking of um last thing i guess before or we, we had to you know the cowboys and start the team wide discussion the nfl last year said we promise we won't play on christmas day if it's on a tuesday or wednesday and then said, oh, actually, we like totally lied because we only care about making money. And we recognize this is a big time opportunity to make money. Uh, the Celtics be damned. So we're going to play on Christmas Day, even though it's on a Wednesday this year. Yeah, that and, sucks. Um, and the tweet I saw from Catherine Fitzgerald, who uh, doesn't she's such a, an incredible beat writer for the Buffalo Bills um, at the Buffalo News. But the teams playing on Christmas will play on the Saturday leading into Wednesday Christmas. Um, and she added that at this point, the NFL plans to rotate Christmas Day teams as the best games in best windows rather than having something similar to Thanksgiving where the Lions and Cowboys always play. First of all, not the Lions and Cowboys' fault that they were visionaries a very long time ago. But second of all, this makes it seem like the NFL is going to make this an annual tradition, like regardless of day. So it's not just we're going to do it this year. It's we're going to do it all the time. And I think you agree we're probably going to get a noon game, an afternoon game, and a night game, and it'll be six different teams every single year. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, that sucks. Do you hear Paul? Paul, hey, buddy. Calm down. Can you no, see I him? Can't. Wait. Can... I can, there he is. I can not see Paul in the most overrated safety of all time. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's untrue. Um, that's not a picture of Troy Palomalo. <laughs> so, wow, uh... what, a, what a recovery. <laughs> wow. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, it sucks. It sucks. I don't think anyone wants that, right? I mean, obviously, you and I are biased. It sucks because we'd have to cover it, and that's not – and I'm – Look, you know, again, and we're grateful we get to do this job, to be clear. But, like, you know, you have to work Thanksgiving every year. That sucks for you every single year. At least I think so. I don't I don't want to have to work Thanksgiving every single year. I don't think that's fun. I don't think that's cool. I don't think it's necessary. Um, and I know the Christmas thing wouldn't be one team every year. But, like, having I, – I worked it this past year. I worked it, I think, the 2017 season. So, you know, already twice in the span of whatever many years. It's just like, let's just chill out. It's, no one's asking for it. It's the NBA, or yeah, it's totally the NBA's thing. Um, if you want to have a game, like, if you want to do it with the weekend thing, fine. You know, if you like they did last year, right? Or the Monday thing, like if it's naturally around the weekend, a, sat- a Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I'm fine with that. I think that's okay to do, it makes some sense. But yeah, if like you're forcing it into a Wednesday game, that's just stupid. And if it's it very fa- transparently a money grab. If it falls on a, on a normal NFL day, and I'll even put Saturdays in the month of December right. because that's become a common thing. But if it falls on a Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, or Monday, you got to leave, you know, that's fine, right? That's just, that's the shake. But that's literally more than half of the time. Yeah. Because that's four of the seven days. Exactly. But there's already it, enough Christmas opportunities. Stop. Yeah. Like, you know, so, but if it falls on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Friday, you got to leave it alone, man. Like, just be cool. By the way, I just saw a tweet from Adam Schefter. It will be two games that the NFL will have. So, not three. Um, and also to have them go from a Saturday to a Wednesday. So now you're not only in, like having them do something reckless and dangerous while caring about player safety with mm-hmm. the hip drop stuff, which everybody's pointed out. But so you're also contaminating two weeks because you're contaminating the Saturday game that you have to go to from Sunday and now the Wednesday game. So it's it's more than just like the Thursday night football where you're contaminating the second game. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. it's just and these are important games. I mean, beyond yeah. the obvious, which is like player health. I mean, it's just I mean, but they don't care and everybody will watch and it's frustrating. Yeah, it's like you said, they're whatever important games and uh, you have that. Like you're saying, the mini buy. Now you're giving a team a mini buy. That could be a massive advantage uh, or disadvantage to the other team having to play them, depending on how they schedule it out. So, yep, unnecessary and dumb. Um, okay, let's talk about the Dallas Cowboys. Even though it's a whole bunch of nothing. Um, so uh, nothing, literally nothing. They haven't happened. signed anyone else. Nothing, dude. There's no rumor. Didn't did they work anyone out? Anyone nope. visiting? Nope. Uh, I saw Jerry. Oh, the big Cowboys thing I saw was Jerry Jones like talking and he was like scribbling on the paper and it's just I, like a bunch of nothing. 
I um I don't want to tell anybody how to have a good time or joke or meme or anything like this, but uh, my radio co-host does this. Um, yeah. Like when when he's on the radio, he just scribbles. Like it's just a, I don't know if it's like a nervous habit or whatever, but like that, I don't think it means anything. But it's no, just, but it does look kind of funny. It, it was it was funny in the context, but like everybody, there were some people who were taking it seriously, who who were like, oh my gosh, he's taking notes or whatever. But um, he offered. I mean, it's a it's really sitting on a tee like Cowboys off season plans or whatever. Right, it's right, just it's Cowboys right there. strategy right now. I, I, and I it's funny because it's like you know it's a billionaire, so it's a guy like ostensibly you're like oh this guy you know is like uh, he thinks at a different level or whatever. But he's just like scribbling like on a piece of paper. It's just very uh, funny. Um, big time updates, I guess that we've gotten from Jerry and McCarthy in terms of speaking at the owners meetings. Um, Jerry believes the run defense is improved even though they've lost a lot of people, but because DeMarvion Overshone will be back um, and Eric Kendricks is here. So the Overshone thing is so reckless to place all this pressure yep. on, on a dude who's technically never played in the NFL. One a third round pick two a third round pick. Granted, he looked great in training camp in the preseason. Sure, but like, but, no, no, no. I mean, I'm just telling both sides of the story. Um, three is, you know, coming off injury right so like that's a big thing in and of itself and four you know the whole thing with dan quinn leaving was we want to get rid of these converted safeties as linebackers we need some legitimate linebackers he was a safety in college like he so he fits that mold too so like he's not even what you are saying that you want moving forward so that's the the first thing jerry also said that the cowboys cannot afford to risk tyron smith hitting the contract extent excuse me the contract incentives in the deal that the new york jets gave him now we covered this a lot of btb did you see anything about this no so tyron's base salary is six and a half million dollars this year and the likely to be earned incentives that his deal has with the jets take him up to 12 and a quarter million dollars so his, his cap hit his cap number for the jets this year is 12 and a quarter million dollars that's it now. And we wrote this in the article. He has some not likely to be earned incentives in his deal as well that he could hit. But those do not count against your cap this year. They count against the Jets cap next year if he hits them. Obviously, whichever ones he ultimately winds up hitting. Those are for a value of six and a half million dollars. And so I don't know if they think that we're just this dumb, that we don't mm -hmm. have access to this information. You know what I'm saying? Like you're telling me that Tyron Smith, who I completely understand the injury risk on and everything, mm -hmm. but who played when he did last year, which was 13 games, like the best left tackle in the NFL. That's how he was graded by PFF. That you couldn't carry a 12 and a quarter million dollar cap charge for that. You know, in a forget the all in in a general year in which you tr are trying to compete and win a Super Bowl. It's so stupid. And so that's one of the headlines. I'm kind of giving you everything to react to here. Mike McCarthy said on. Uh, well, let me Tuesday. stop down on Tyron just real quick. This okay. quick thing I have to say about that. It's like it's at a, such a, an important position, too. It's not like at a, you know, a luxury position where you can kind of afford, like maybe like, let's say running back where you might want to go cheaper in general. It's like left tackle. It's the second most highest paid position in the NFL. It's like, well, maybe if there's a spot to take that kind of risk, maybe that's the spot to do it. And and on top of that. A, a player who you got on the cheap for a very long time, who yeah, you know what I'm saying, who was like player. severely undercompensated. Um, I'm, look, I'm not trying to say Tyron hasn't made a lot of money, but like relative to like performance was, un, you know, no, undercompensated. no, inarguably, I was pissed when they signed him to that extension. I was like, what the hell is this? This is like yeah. Atlanta Braves. Uh, shout out to my good friends, Jack Fritz and James Seltzer, who joke that like the Braves like bring like guns to the negotiation of their players and like, like hold it to their players' heads. Maybe it's a little too morbid, but like, point being, like, they just like threaten their players to sign these insanely yeah. under market deals. So, severely undercompensated, homegrown player will be in the Ring of Honor, will be in the Hall of Fame. Like, if there were ever a dude to make exception for exception for exception for, it would be him. So, mm -hmm. we had that come out on Tuesday. Mike McCarthy, um, well, on Wednesday, on Monday, he was on NFL Live with Adam Schefter. And, man, good to so Mike McCarthy. He's a better person than I think you and I are. Um, he towed the company line. He said he's not worried about the lack of frigency moves. He even said he's used to it, obviously, as the head coach of the Packers for forever. They notoriously don't do this. And the Cowboys so badly want to be them because they live rent-free in their minds. Once again, the team I hate the most outside the NFC East for obvious reasons, um, especially because now they're contaminating the Cowboys by in terms of their way of thinking. But uh, beyond that, McCarthy said from the breakfast table on Tuesday that both Mozzie Smith and Luke Schoonmaker had offseason shoulder surgeries. So now you're talking about a world where your top 100 picks from last year in a draft class that was already very not good, they are all coming back from some sort of surgery mm -hmm. either before or after their rookie season, obviously overshones before. Um, and you're counting on them to a significant degree. The whole thing reeks to high hell. I'm so pissed. I hate everything. 
I did, uh, you know, see the clip of Schefter uh, interviewing McCarthy. You referenced that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was kind of funny because Schefter even pushes back on it because McCarthy's like, oh, you know, like, hey, we're good. You know, we don't need to sign anyone right now. We're making, in- you know, the-, the improvements we have internally are great. And Adam Schefter is like, so that's your message to Cowboys fans? <laughs> like, are you sure? Like, are you sure you want to go with that? Because uh, they're probably not going to be too thrilled about that. And in fairness, Martin McCarthy did talk about how the offseason is long. And I've said that. Um, there's a lot of chances to still add players. But uh, while that is true, more than one thing can be true. And the Cowboys certainly, I think, missed a big window where they could have added even more players uh, still at a reasonable rate. So that's kind of what we've been saying for the past so many episodes here since free agency began, really. And it still rings true because they haven't done anything. So... Basically, everything is really bad. Um, and I will say, this is a weird way to put it, but I'm proud of Cowboys fans. Like, And I think whenever times are bad with the Eagles, I think you would agree with this. Like, You have your homers no matter what, right? Like, You have people that are, oh, the team is right. You don't know. Like, You, you, know, you don't know what they're planning. Like, you, You're not going to trust the guys who are there every day. But, you know what I mean? Like, You have that stuff no matter what. Um, but most people are kind of have, have had their eyes opened a little bit this off season. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't even think at this point it was the way the season ended. I think people are almost willing to forgive that, right? Like I think people are almost willing to say, you know what, dude, it sucked. I was really mad, but it's sports. Sometimes you just lose. I, I think what's really, really, really pushed people is that they do not seem to care about fixing that. There was mm-hmm. like a level of trust that, okay, you know what? We're going to give you this mulligan, but you know, get to work and fix it. And that they haven't done that has really upset a lot of people. And a topic that a lot of people are kind of coming around towards is how much the Cowboys spend. And I mean actual cash spend, not salary cap space. Uh, Mm -hmm. There was a great thread on Twitter from Joey Ikes, who does a podcast for us at BTB, longtime BTBer. And there was a great article on our site by the legendary OCC, who I know you love um, and have loved forever. Uh, I don't know if you read this article, uh, but OCC wrote about the Cowboys cash spending basically from 2013 till now. So almost Mm. the dawn of the new CBA. There are some exceptions there. Um, He couldn't find information for 2020. Obviously, that's a really unique year. Uh, But looking at just the last three years, which I think is kind of notable because the Cowboys love to hang their hats on, you know, you know, we've won 12 games in a row each last three years, blah, blah, blah. It's been the little run they've had under Mike McCarthy. In those three years, where do you think the Cowboys rank in terms of total cash spending across the entire NFL? Um, 10th. The Eagles rank 10th. They have spent $655.2 million. Oh. Okay. The Giants rank 15th. They spent $636.9 million. Mm. NFL average is $627.4 million. The Commanders, this is mostly the cheap Dan Snyder era, by the way. The the Commanders have spent $618.4 million. All right, that's 19th. The Cowboys are down at 30th. They have spent five hundred thirty-four point <laughs> three million dollars over the last America's three years. team, baby. So forgetting the, the, decimal, the most valuable fran- sports franchise in the world. Forgetting the decimal, just rounding. Dallas at five thirty-four, Washington at six eighteen, NFL average at six twenty-seven, the Giants at six thirty-six, over a hundred million more. Philly at six hundred fifty-five. You're talking about these teams that are finding ways and manipulating the salary cap to spend more money in the name of winning. Now, in the last three years, have the Eagles or Giants or Commanders won a Super Bowl? No. Have any of them won more games than the Cowboys? I don't think that the Eagles have um, in the last three years, but it might be very close. It's pretty close. Yeah, whatever. But you get my point. Have have they been better than the Cowboys or whatever? Like you I, Again, I'm not here to debate the, the specifics of this. Well, that's but, not the standard. It's not just about being no, better but, than but, your divisional what I, I know, I know. Opponents. But what I'm here to say is, like, even if they haven't, even if they'd all been, like, unbelievably worse they tried really hard you know what i mean they, they tried as hard as they possibly could right. to be as good as they possibly could and that the cowboys are this beyond this this goes back to the point i made to you last week if you are truly that you know poor in terms of not literally but that poor in terms of spending and you're this good in terms of success by your own metrics then maybe pay the people at the very least who are responsible for you being this good like your quarterback and your head coach in this particular era it's ridiculous, dude. It's so frustrating. And I do think a lot of people are, are upset with them and now believe more than ever that they view this, the Joneses, as a business and as a part of their portfolio, not as something they're trying to capitalize on from a success standpoint. Rank the NFC East owners. I don't give Jeffrey Lurie a lot of credit. 
when it comes to the Eagles. Like, I give Howie Roseman all the credit. So, like, I'm not trying to take away from Jeffrey Lurie. Well, but I, if you want to say that, though, but, like, Jeffrey Lurie has, like, famously stuck by him through sure, thick and thin and in times where he honestly probably shouldn't have, but it did work out. So I would give it's I, tough to separate. I would give John Mara a lot more credit than I think you would because I, well, I think like, I'm asking you to rank him. I'm going to go John Mara. Number Jeff- one? Yeah. What the hell? Are I think he me? really cares. I, I think Jeffrey Lurie cares, has, but he's clueless. They're clearly clueless. Well, but he's also willing to empower people, and that sometimes they're the wrong people. This is but, an I awful mean, ranking. Their Super he, Bowls are he, so he, fluky, dude. Like it's not like this. You sh- asked for my opinion, so it's I'm going so John Mara. Have a better Je- opinion. <laughs> I'm going Jeffrey Lurie, and then I'm going to go Jerry Jones, just That's, because oh you know God. Josh Harris is so new. I can't, I can't give him, you know, above. I Jerry would say Clinton. Lurie number one. Um, and, and part of what you said there, the cash spending thing, if you shrink that window, I don't how long of a window was that you said? How many years? This, this is just 2021. But I do think you, I'll send it to you. I think you would enjoy this because Philly has been at the top in the yeah. entire data set that Lars. Yes, sampled. very, yeah, there's a good window. I forget exactly when it is where like the Eagles are definitely like one or two. They're very high up there. And that also fits the um, kind of what the Eagles like to do with how they handle the salary cap. Like they're willing to restructure so many con- so many contracts and uh take on you know dead money and stuff because lurry is willing to pay that money out of right. pocket, up front like signing bonus not just where the cowboys by contrast are more interested in having it as the players earn it through a base right. salary which is like you know it's not totally invalid or it's there's there's pros and cons to everything it's not like there's one right way to do it but if you're going to be aggressive with it and you're going to try to get an edge with it, it it's kind of like how the eagles have done it anyway so um, this is from the article, and again, everyone should read it. OCC wrote it at BTB. I, I sent it to you on Slack, BLG. Um, the Cow- this is directly from it. The Cowboys ranked just 25th over the four-year period from tw- mm-hmm. 2013 through 2016, and that's despite signing Tony Romo to a then-franchise record $108 million contract extension in 2013 that made him the fifth-highest-paid player in the NFL at the time. There, here's your line. The Eagles rank number one over the period. Mm-hmm. This is 13 through 16 with 613.9 million in cash bin, yep. a cool $22 million more per season than yep. the Cowboys. So your direct adversary, your, your direct challenger, the biggest threat to you within the division is spending $22 million more per season. I don't know what the NFL salary cap was off the top of my head in this uh, window on average, but call it, I don't know, $110 million. Um, Although I don't know what it was, but I mean, I'd be, but either way, that's a significant percentage of the salary cap that they're finding a way to spend more. This is the Cowboys view this as a budgeting tool versus Mm -hmm. teams like the Eagles. And I would put the Browns there. I would put the Vikings there. They view it as a weapon to manipulate and and, and take advantage of. Exactly. And back to Joey's Twitter thread, uh, which I know he was on the ticket talking about on Tuesday. He, his, this was more tinfoil hat theory. But he talked about how the Cowboys are just a part of the Joneses business portfolio and they're, pro- they're how they're probably not even the Joneses most profitable business and how when Jerry bought the Cowboys in the obviously late 80s, early 90s, that he sunk all of his like business equity into the team. And so from a business standpoint, in order to succeed, in order to have a positive return on investment, the Cowboys had to succeed, right? Like the Cowboys had to have success for him to have business success. And so it, at the time, there was a higher level of energy and a higher level of devotion or whatever you want to call it. And they obviously had success. And that was able to be parlayed into this and this and this and more and more and more and more. And maybe other NFL owners are in buildings or in situations like that. I don't know Jeffrey Lurie's financial status, but, you know, there's definitely an an NFL owner who has just the team that they own. They don't have all these other subsidiary sort of things like Jerry or Arthur Blank or Stan Kroenke or whatever the case may be. So it can just exist because especially the Cowboys, they're this this organism that sort of is now this like self-living self-governing thing that just is so insulated by its brand and the NFL's brand that you don't have to spend like you can argue and OCC did, did, did this in the article and I'll let you react and we can move on after this every dollar if you look at it as a business spent on the Cowboys is spent way shorter than it is for every other NFL team Right, like you think about like a dollar that, that the Jaguars would spend their ownership, it goes so much farther because of what they're trying to grow. You can almost argue that spending money is losing money from a business standpoint for the Cowboys because their brand is so large relative to the entire field. Yo, go Lurry number one, go <laughs> Josh Harris number two, just by by virtue oh my of gosh. by virtue of he hasn't proved yet to be terrible. I mean, this Jerry Jones stuff, I know the success has been there on field, but in terms of like owner giving you the edge, I think I have a hard time saying second right now, especially after all the stuff you're saying. I'll put him three and I'll put the so that it's not 
I get what you're saying with Amira. You think he cares like a fan, and that's nice and all. But also, I think they're clueless. And also, I think part of the biggest problem with the Giants, or a problem with them, might not be the biggest problem, is the split ownership. I think that kind of causes not a cohesive vision always. And I think that's kind of what went down like Eli late career was that there was some desire to move on from him uh, from maybe like the Tish side, I think it was, but then the Mara side wanted to hold on to him. So there's, I think that that rare kind of thing where they have the double ownership thing kind of works against them. And they've been so inept. They've been literally the worst team or one of the worst teams since like 2017. So I'm going to rank them towards the bottom down there and their Super Bowls are fluky. So boom. Um, we should probably take a break because we haven't even gotten to the Eagles. Uh, I'm sorry, but one second, and I'm going to have to try to write about this in parallel to us um, talking here. Ian what? Rappaport just tweeted right now. Cowboys did something? No. Uh, the Cow- This is his tweet verbatim. Down. The-, the Cowboys and QB Dak Prescott have a mutual understanding of his contract situation, sources say, with no offers from Dallas despite him being in a contract year. O- owner Jerry Jones said, we are where we are, locked and loaded for this year. No indication. <laughs> Dak's going to be a free agent, baby. I'm I'm curious. He is. I, I mean, literally, no, no, no. he is. I, I'm I'm not. Um, I'm curious. You can't tag him. I know. I know. My question is, how does this make you feel? Because if you're happy, then that's an acknowledgement that Dak is very good. Well, I think he's an, an idiot if he doesn't test the market. So, I mean, I think it's great if he tests the market because then either he gets way too much money from the Cowboys, or he leaves, and the Cowboys. I mean, I'll take quarterback X over like Dak in terms of there's a lot of room to go down for sure. Um, so I think it's the worst case scenario for the Cowboys. So that's why I'm happy about it. Uh, how do you feel but, about it? So I'm mean, trying to like, say I, like, well, if you think this is bad news, then you think he's good. It's like we yeah, got you thing. You but very it, obviously it, do. It, no, that's but, not the point, though. The point is it's bad news for the Cowboys and that's the biggest deal of it. <laughs> it's bad news because he's good. So you think Dak is good. That's fine. Uh, it's bad moving... news because they're either going to lose him or they're going to overpay him. And so, they're going to overpay him means that he is my thing. obviously good it, to a point, but not this, good enough ultimately. This is where like this ultimately all boils down to, or what it all boils down to. He is now less than a year from true open market free agency, right? Like he has unparalleled, I would say like th- that has not existed. Uh, presuming God willing full health for him throughout the season, because right. even the quarterbacks that have hit it um, have, have done so with like some sort of qualifier, like Kirk this off season, Peyton, obviously in 2012, um, you know, Kirk, it wasn't viewed. I think you would agree the way Dak would be viewed in, in the off season. Um, the time he did hit free agency when he was healthy, mm-hmm. when he signed with Minnesota. So like in, in the dawn of like quarterback, stupid money, Nobody has ever been in this situation. I guess Tom Brady kind of was um, in 2020 when he joined the Bucks, but even then he was viewed as a little old, it's and different. nobody. Yeah, yeah I, again, it was it was unique in and of itself. That you would risk this happening is so unfathomably dumb. I mean, so mm-hmm. unbelievably dumb, and that you don't understand that in order to prevent this, you have to have you have to offer something that is worth turning down that golden ticket for Dak. You know what I'm saying? That has to be the offer. Whether you think that's fair or not, that's the position you put yourself in. You know what I'm saying? And and so they have done this. And now they're going to risk, I don't care how good you think Dak is, not you specifically, BLG, but anybody. But he is undeniably a top flight quarterback in the NFL. Top 10, top seven, top, again, define it how you want. If you were to ever trade him, which you can't because he has a no trade clause. Mm -hmm. But if you were, you would fetch what? three first round picks like, we're, you know, like we don't have to sit here and, and debate the specifics mm-hmm. of that, but like you would get a lot. And now you are on the verge of watching him not only leave your team and therefore leave you unqualified at the, at the most important position in the game, but literally leave a oh, cool. You, you'll get a 2026 third round compensatory pick because we damn know that you won't sign anybody to balance it out yourselves on your side of free agency. So this is, this has the potential to be the most completely botched, free agency quarterback situation in modern NFL history. We're, we're getting closer and closer and closer to that. And there's no viable backup plan, right? There's nothing. I mean, because, you know, Trey Lance will be a free agent after this year, right? Um, obviously, Cooper Rush is not the answer. I mean, it'll be, I think, you know, hearing that and the draft coming up, I don't think the Cowboys are going like, to trade up to number three or something like crazy. But, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what they do in the draft at quarterback. Because they're, they're, if that's the case, they have to hedge their bet. It feels like, in some regard, unless they're just going to roll really with what they have. But uh, yeah, it's really dumb in terms of speaking, giving your team an edge. I mean, that's not giving your team an edge by w- trying to wait 
This is the best case scenario for the Cowboys, obviously. This goes without saying. They win the Super Bowl, and it's like the Joe Flacco thing. Or you just pay him. doesn't matter. Like Just literally pay him literally any amount he wants. And even if it's like a terrible contract, in theory, who cares? You just won the Super Bowl. That's the only way this works out. That's the only situation that's a good situation for the Cowboys. Um, I hate everything, and I'm going to have to write an article while Brandon's telling me about how the Eagles are doing things successfully. So let's take a break and then get to that. Go ahead. I don't even care anymore. <laughs> Baseball wow. season starts in two days. I'm good. It's off season is beating you down. Uh, Eagle stuff. Well, Quez Watkins isn't back. That's cool. We like that. He's gone. Eagle signed Paris Campbell from the Giants. He was bad last year and was like one of their 70 slot receivers they had on the roster. He'll compete for that Quez Watkins spot along with Devontae Parker. Ostensibly, I think the real goal is to try to get someone in the draft who can beat out both of those guys and uh, be a nice little third option when it comes to the receiver group behind A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. And also just, this is something I don't want to jinx here, but I've been thinking about it. Like A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith has stayed remarkably healthy. And it makes sense. They're younger players. They haven't had long injury histories. But over the past two years, like they've barely missed any time. I think Devontae wouldn't have even missed the one game he did last year if it weren't for it being like kind of a meaningless Week 18 game. Obviously, AJ missed the playoff game. So um, more than zero games missed, but still very few games missed. So uh, they definitely kind of, I think, need to take a little bit more of an investment in receiver, especially the draft, I think, being the way to go there after what they've already added. Um, not much else. They signed a nickel cornerback from the Raiders. His name is Tyler Hall. He might be their nickel cornerback this year. He might not. Uh, there isn't a lot of super big, juicy headlines. Even at a Howie Roseman, I would say some of the big takeaways from him speaking were that they felt like they missed the swagger. So that's obviously factoring into the CJGJ contract, which I think I saw was only like $10 million guaranteed. So not too much of a risk there. Um, they also talked about how Saquon's going to be a big part of the plans. And I think that's maybe somewhat noteworthy in terms of, uh, by the way, today's March 26th, Saquon Barkley. Is he wearing 26 with the Eagles? I think so. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a you question. I think he's keeping his number. Yeah. He said he considered eight, I believe, but that's actually what CJ DJ is going with because of Kobe. Um, even though he could have gone 23. Yeah, Saquon's 26. Um the messaging with Saquon is very much that, you know, he's running back one, which is not how the Eagles have handled things in for a while now, honestly, probably since Shady, where they're like, Yeah, you know, we're uh, the might... DeMarco disrespect. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean true but okay demarco murray i guess but that's not even true though because they had ryan matt they signed ryan matthews that's too right, that's right. and they had both of those guys there um and obviously demarco sucked as well so that wasn't even the case it was really going back to the days of shady and obviously to talking more about when howie roseman was actually in charge of the team which he was not in 2015 so uh there's been a lot of talk about saquon and how you know they're really gonna I think ride him and how the running back thing, how he kind of talked about, he thinks running backs have become a little bit undervalued. It's gone a little bit too far in the running backs don't matter thing. And uh, lastly on this Sirianni, one of the bigger things from his press conference was that uh, he compared Saquon to the AJ Brown acquisition and that they definitely want to like design the offense in no small part to feature him and be a big weapon in the offense. Not just a, he's not just a running back. He's a weapon. He can pass protect. He can catch the ball. He can do everything. He can, and I was talking about this uh, on a show, I guess it on this week, the mythical offseason fantasy football Twitter loves this thing. Oh, this running back is lining up in the slot. Oh, no, well, watch <laughs> out. It's going to revolutionize that Tony Pollard in the slot. Oh, my gosh. How are teams going to defend? Never happens. Never actually manifests anything meaningful in the regular season. Could that be different with the Eagles? We'll see with your boy Kellen Moore in charge now, in charge, and quote-unquote. Um, I think Sirianni keeps saying it's a meshing of the systems. Um, but I think that's all that's going on in Eagles land, other than, yes, they also added Will Greer, as we talked about earlier, who is very much here to, I think, just be a camp arm slash help some of the other quarterbacks translate this whatever schematic or the terms, the language, from uh, the Cowboys parlance to maybe to what is going to be now the Eagles new setup. So uh, there you go. Um, so a couple things here. Um, the, um, 
Roger Goodell downplayed health. I just saw this right now. So um, when talking about playing on Christmas, that's hilarious. But the thing I was going to get to, uh, Packers president Mark Murphy told reporters that the NFL is deciding between them and the Browns to play the Eagles in Brazil in mm. week one. You mentioned that game is on Peacock. So we know the Eagles are playing in Brazil week one. It's that on is Peacock, te- but it's still technically will be on NBC locally. Okay, but that's technically, speaking of locally, a home game for the Eagles, right? That they're giving up? Yes. Okay. So that's one of the nine, because the NFC gets nine this year. Um, one of the nine home games that's being played in Brazil. It's on Peacock for international audience, or not international, for the non-local audience. I, I don't know where it is for the international audience, except mm-hmm. for Brazil. But um, P- Packers or Browns, who would you rather play in week one? Um, uh, That's a good question. Uh, I, I guess, I don't really care. I guess the Browns, I, in terms of, like, I'm trying to think strategically what's the best. Um versus i guess the browns because in theory deshaun watson could stink so bad that he gets like benched at some point don't you mm-hmm. think that's on the table for this season like that's that's plausible it's possible that um they go to Jameis or tyler huntley or or uh dtr at some point that deshaun watson is so bad i feel like that's on the table by the end of the season so i'd rather them play him early in the year um assuming he is going to be bad again so yeah Although you could say it could be better to face them later in the year with the thought that uh, you're hope you're hoping they're more banged up and like maybe Miles Garrett misses a game or something. But I'll say that uh, the Browns. Um, I think so too. I'd rather play the Browns with Deshaun. Uh, so I don't know when the Cowboys are going to draw them, but you know because the NFC East plays the NFC North this year. Also, but... maybe there's a little bit like of a hangover there because the Browns had like this like magical ride until you know they lost to the Texans for a little bit. So maybe they're thinking like they're a little bit better than they are like they're they're hot stuff and there's like a reality check for them i could see that kind of happening whereas the packers i think kind of have this uh packers would be underdogs in that game i'm guessing and they kind of have this like house money young team feel ready to take a step forward i think the packers are a little bit scarier in a week one scenario i agree they still kind of not i don't know that the packers are going to be like a hot super bowl pick i think they'll be like a hot nfc north pick but um they're a hot super bowl bet pick in terms of uh right. like the odd value value pick sorry i'm talking word. like the week one pregame shows you know no one's gonna be picked when they're like okay brandon yeah. give us your super bowl 59 pick you know no one's gonna be like oh uh the packers whatever um because people are still gonna say like the lions like the lions are gonna be one of those picks again you know what i'm saying um but so the, you could like i'm i don't want the packers in that that moment mm-hmm. I'm, I'm way 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 afraid of them but so beyond that on, are we done with the Eagles? Because I don't know, but um, I want to make sure we hit everything. I think I mean, so. The Will Greer thing, if I have that right, like he was going to be the quarterback three, presumably, until they traded for Trey Lance, and then it was clear he wasn't. And then he had that awesome third preseason game or good preseason third he, preseason. That was the final preseason game. Um, I can't believe we hadn't talked about this, but um, he had the final preseason game, and it was like the day after they traded yeah. for Trey Lance. So and, it was kind of cool for him that he got like one last. Shot. And I don't know if you knew this um, on the subject of offensive play caller. Dak was the offensive play caller for that mm. game. So um, and it was like Dak, Eagles offensive coordinator in 2044. Yeah, that, that was that was the funny thing I thought about this was that Dak was Will Greer's offensive coordinator. And now Kellen going to steal his plays. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, so and it was a really uh, and it was a real big bummer when Greer didn't make the Cowboys roster um, just because he was really well liked. And a lot of people thought right. after the 20. 20- one 22 season that he had a chance last year to be Cooper Rush out for the backup mm-hmm. job. But then Cooper Rush had the run he had and it was like, oh, well, you know, um, so but he's he's a good dude, cool guy, easy to root for. He bounced around last year after the Cowboys moved on. Yeah. And so I I will say it is interesting how Kellen Moore has brought in Doug Nussmeyer. Mm-hmm. And um, now Will Greer. I know I'm missing somebody else. There's another uh, staff member. It's not like a position coach. I think it's a little bit lower. But there's another guy, yeah, from the Kellen Moore or two from the Kellen Moore, the Cowboys, yeah. former Cowboys guys. So it's almost like we really want you to be Dak, Jalen. It's just just go be Dak, please. Uh, that's go what we all yeah. are are rooting for. Um, okay. Um, anything uh, else on the Eagles? No, I think that's it for now. Uh, we'll, we're going to hear from Jeffrey Lurie tonight. Uh, as after we're recording this podcast on Tuesday around two o'clock Eastern. So we'll see what he says, but um, you can stay tuned to BGN radio for that. Uh, Giants still buzz. They could take a quarterback, trade up for a quarterback. 
J.J. McCarthy has been connected not only to them, but also the commanders, who we can get to, obviously, last. But uh, that's kind of interesting. I saw Ed, our good friend, Ed Valentine, did a, a mock draft where I think he does like a mock draft a week for Big Blue View. And he, he, they're not done as just, you know, like, here's what I would do. He does them as, like, here's a potential option, like a thought experiment that we should explore. So he did that with J.J. McCarthy uh, this week and not popular. From what I'm gathering with Giant Sands, that post has 685 comments, RJ. So there's clearly a big heated discussion going on in the comments there on Big Blue View. The other big thing, I guess, from them is that uh, um, uh, I'm... you can do this. Brian Dable. I almost said Thank Dan Brian Dable uh, and both, I think the Maras, like John Mara too, basically pretty much, de- they definitively said Daniel Jones is their starting quarterback, which isn't surprising to you or me, but they could have left it a little bit more open-ended and they didn't. So, and I think that's true. Even if they do draft a quarterback, I still think they're going to give Daniel Jones one last chance because he's there anyway, and they don't necessarily feel the need to force a rookie in right away. Um, but yeah, that's really, that's all that's going on. I think in giants land. Yeah. Um, what happens to them in the draft is obviously the story of their entire season, but nothing, nothing crazy, nothing wild. You did have something you wanted to get to on the commanders though. Um, that was from, was it Tom Pelissero? Was it his quote? Yes. Speaking at the owners meetings, basically he was saying he was surveying what other teams, you know, are doing. So it's not necessarily a direct commander source, but more of that kind of the league expects this to happen. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, a lot of smoke screen stuff, who knows, but he's saying that, you know, JJ McCarthy could be the commander's guy. And, you know, I've previously said that I think they're going to um, take uh, Jaden Daniels. But also to a bigger point, I don't think it's Drake May. That's kind of what I, I guess, more believe in. So I'm kind of taking a half of a victory lap on that, where if it comes to pass. But uh, there seems to be some like momentum behind this in terms of maybe JJ McCarthy, not necessarily the best prospect, but the best fit for a guy who comes from a Kyle Shanahan tree and uh, the, the commander's new GM, Adam Peters. So. And funny enough, our good friend Ben Solak said his comparison, his NFL comp for J.J. McCarthy is Brock Purdy. So maybe there's something to that. And, you know, everyone likes to, I think, poke fun about the Mac Jones thing in, what was that, 2021? That that was 2021, yeah. But everyone kind of made fun of that as, like, that was ridiculous. That wasn't going to happen. Yeah. I think it was closer to happening than, obviously, didn't happen. But you also saw, like... We saw how, okay, it didn't happen, but then we saw how Kyle Shanahan hated Trey Lance and didn't want to play him. So, you know, maybe maybe Kyle Shanahan really did want Mac Jones, and that's why a lot of people were saying that at the time. And then ownership or whoever else, the GM, kind of, you know, made a different decision. I think people uh, incorrectly assume that teams, everyone within a team is at a given time pulling in the same direction. That is often not the case. It's also it's not the case in any kind of industry, I feel like, or relationship necessarily so uh yeah we'll see what the commanders do there at quarterback i think it's safe to say you would be joining me and liking uh jj mccarthy ending up in either washington or new york right Mm -hmm. okay sorry i'm uh, this there was an update on the dag thing this is how the sausage gets made around here you know that's just we're almost done just finish it out (laughs) I know. Well, this is a kind of a big time thing, um, and I, well, I can't. I, have an, I can't just speak by myself. Though. I have. I have an update for you. I, I really like the Commanders off season, and I, at this point, I'm. There's not a quarterback they can take that's gonna, you know, push me off of that. You know what I'm saying? Like, even if they took JJ McCarthy at two, I, I wouldn't feel like, oh, what a bunch of losers. Like well, that's so stupid. They ruined this. You know what I mean? Like, rank the quarterbacks you would most prefer them to take at number two. Jane most Daniels, prefer them to take because you're like Daniels, not threatened by them. Jaden Daniels, JJ McCarthy, Drake May. Wow. Yeah, I think I'd have McCarthy number one. I, and, then... I, and I'm willing to be wrong on the Jaden Daniels thing, but like I'm the his frame concerns me. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, like if I was I the, if I was that team, like I'm not at all denying that he has a higher ceiling than someone like JJ McCarthy, right. but I think but McCarthy might have a floor. A, right, exactly. And it, especially it's not just like, oh, it's my first round quarterback. It's your number two overall quarterback. So that you know adds to the so number two overall quarterback at a time where like this is the this is the franchise reset. It's now. Like it it's now or 
not that they can't recover from it, but it could be a, a long time until they recover. There was actually a very, I think, honest and sobering article on Hogshaven recently that I read about, like, what are the fair expectations for uh, a quarterback taken at number two? And on historical context, even they were admitting, like, it's a bit much to expect this guy to be the franchise savior. Just based on history, you know, based on uh, how the draft goes, how quarterbacks are evaluated and turn out to be and go to, you know, teams that aren't very good. Like, it's a lot to expect this guy to instantly be the savior. Now, again, that can happen. The ceiling is there. You can see what a, a CJ Stroud does for an organization, for example, or Joe Burrow. And maybe the commanders end up hitting on that guy. Obviously, Burrow a little less likely of a parallel because of being him being the number one overall pick and such a, a dominant prospect in his final year at LSU. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's ultimately what it comes down to. It's going to define their era, their next era of commander football. All this free agency stuff is great and whatnot. They're going to be a better team. They've raised their floor. Dan Quinn is an upgrade over your favorite coach, Ron Rivera. That's fine. Doesn't really matter if they can't get the quarterback right. Uh, they're not exactly scaring anyone with Marcus Mariota back there. Um, we've got to get out of here very soon. So a couple of quick hitting things now that we're done with the commanders. Songs and- too. Exactly. My thanks to Brandon for uh, carrying us a little bit. First, Ian Rappaport added an update um, to his tweet, which makes it worse. Um, He quoted it. He quoted himself and said, this appears. So, like, I don't know if you agreed, but like the initial tweet seemed kind of hypothetical to me or seemed seemed like kind of vague. And you know what I mean? Like it could mean the deal's coming. It could mean it's Mm -hmm. not coming, whatever. The second one makes me want to vomit. Um, He quoted himself and said, this appears to clear the path for Dak Prescott to test free agency. 2025. Well, I mean, it's just common sense too, right? Because if the Cowboys were going to do a restructure in an aggressive way, they would have done it by now because that was how you get the full benefit of doing that. There's no, what's the point of doing it later? That doesn't benefit you. I agree. I mean, and what's, it, and what's Dak's reason to do it at that point? Like, why is it? Dak is a fool. And I thought he was dumb last time to cave when he did. He ultimately made out relatively well, but he could have made out even better if he just waited a little bit longer to test the market. And uh, so maybe he'll cave again to the much to the delight of Cowboys fans. But at this point, it just feels like there's no good reason to because he enters free agency next year. And even if it's a deal that he gets from the Cowboys, it's going to be an awesome deal for him. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. So that's that Uh, next thing. And then we'll do songs. There was a report that the in-season hard knocks this year will be centered on a division, not a specific team. Cause it's come on, baby. Come on. You know, it's division to pick NFL. If it is the NFC East, do we have yeah. to commit to like live shows or something like live break th- breakdowns I after think, the episodes or something? I think so I think right? we have to do. I mean, yeah, I think I, yeah. So um, I believe those air on Tuesdays. So what's the point of this podcast that we don't do that? Yeah. So if I'm right and they air Tuesdays and it's the NFC East, I think starting those weeks in, in the NFL season, we would push our show to being a live one for as long as the episodes run, like the six we weeks or whatever. It out. They might be, we could do shorter episodes. Depends on, yeah, what we're getting content wise. If it's actually any good, but yeah, I think we, I think we kind of have to. Um, okay. Let's uh, do songs and get out of here. Rachelle got her submitted very, very early because she is the best. And I'm pulling it up right now. She went with dance the night by Dua Lipa. And you added an exclamation emoji. Yeah. I like it. I like a Dua Lipa. Dua Lipa. Uh, I can't say like, I know all of her discography. I'm not like an expert or anything, mm-hmm. um, but I like her. I like her music. So, boom. Um, I'm gonna go with a song that plays at a lot of San Antonio Spurs games. The Spurs who won without Wemby on Tuesday night. Um, <laughs> okay, who cares? Well, well, I do because I have to assign my sports energy mm-hmm. somewhere right now, and it's definitely not the Cowboys. Um, I'm going with "Let's Get Loud" by Jennifer Lopez. Mm, wow. Um. I'm going to break from theme of uh, Latin artist to go with uh, Taking Back Sunday's Great Romances of the 20th Century, specifically the demo version. Because the demo version has this spoken intro that I think is a great addition to the song. It is not on their actual album. So I'll find a way to send that to you. Okay. Uh, it's also, it is available on Spotify as well. So it's out there. It shouldn't be impossible to find. But it's such a long title that it's hard to see like demo version at the end. You know what I mean? Like you're not seeing like it's not like a one uh, song title and then you see demo after it. So you kind of have to like let it scroll to see the whole thing. So anyway, uh, yeah, finally good to get some taking back Sunday representation 
on the playlist here. So I'm going to go with that song. I hate everything um, and everyone. And our good friend Holden loves your misery, by the way. He is. I, the feeds, this is my this is my last thing, and then we, we can go. Him. I meant to ask you last week. Um, I know it feeds him, and Holden runs whenever he has misery. He's not even you know doesn't have that's enough not, honor to, to face the fight. He does. Um, that's okay. But so um, is this he, enjoy like this? I think all Cowboys fans are curious. Is this enjoyable? Because what it, what it feels like to me is when the Cowboys played the Eagles the second time and you were so like down, you were like, I, I'm not even like into this. Like the Eagles are going to lose and like they're going to fall apart. And obviously all that stuff happened. But so like I would think that it would be like maybe at first it was funny and maybe like every time something happens, you're like, haha, that sucks for them. But I do think it, it probably sucks a little bit because it's taking some steam out of competition. Holden did say he missed you on Monday Football Monday, so there is a positive of compliment. I live rent free in Holden's mind. So, but uh, anyway, um, no, I'm I'm good with it. I'm pretty cool with it. It's not like spike the football happy about it. Like let's go because it's not really that kind of thing. Because it's just they're doing nothing. So not like yeah, I'm so fired up about the Cowboys doing nothing. It's more of just like oh, that's like a relief. It's kind of just like oh, good. They're not making a trade. There isn't some kind of big thing popping up now. Watch me jinx it here. I was actually looking at the Cowboys transactions because for some reason in my head, I thought they kind of like waited out the uh, market a little bit and got um, Stephon Gilmore and Brandon Cooks like in April or later. That wasn't no, even true. Was, I was looking at it was the dates early. It, it was like the first week of free it agency. Was last March year. 19th for yep. Brandon Cooks. And then Gilmore. And then it was like two days later. Yeah. Gilmore. Yeah, it was actually right near the start of free agency. So, and then after that, you know what the Cowboys did after that? Like almost nothing. Like they resigned Jonathan Hankins. And I'm looking at all of their other moves after that. And basically, until no, basically the whole rest of the summer, they did nothing. So, just based on precedent, it's not like, well, don't worry, because we're going to make some moves later, like the Eagles do when they traded for CJGJ, like right before the season, or made some moves in training, like signed Zach Cunningham in training camp, whatever. Um, Cowboys don't have a history of doing that. They did sign Malik Hooker in training camp a couple of years ago, and then they signed him to an extension last year during camp. Um, yeah. They, I mean, they brought in Brett Maher, um, you know, Cavante Turpin. I mean, Anthony Barr. Like they brought in a handful of dudes, but Alfred Morris once upon a time. I mean, but this is so dumb. I hate. They are making me. I'm being serious. They are making. I was telling stats. They are making me like football less. So. <laughs> That's great. That's music to my ears. Um, let's, Speaking of songs, let's leave in the perfect ballad. As we do, say whatever you want. I really don't care. Whatever I want, I don't really care. It doesn't matter. Blah blah blah.